Hello once again everyone it's Dr. Trussell here and I'm sure by now you're really falling in love with accounting. Uh, really is a, a great subject. It's I know it's challenging there's lots to it and uh, this is another chapter that has lots of details. So what we're going to do in this chapter we're going to talk about receivables. Now the types of receivables we're going to look at. You've already seen accounts receivable before. We're going to talk about notes receivable and other receivables too. So accounts receivable and notes receivable are the primary topics. And then how do we present the receivables on the balance sheet and then how do we manage them? The types of receivables. First of all, receivables like accounts receivable are amounts due from individuals and companies that are expected to be collected in cash. For example, you sell something on account means that customers are going to pay you in the future. That's what we call an accounts receivable. And then a written promise for uh, which is a formal instrument for amount to be received is called trade receivable and we call those notes receivable in the accounting records. Then we have our so-called non-trade receivables such as interest loans to officers advances etc and those we call other receivables. And just to give you an idea of how big an asset that receivables are for some companies. Here are various companies, All you've probably heard of all of these companies before, and they have, many of them have lots of accounts receivable, uh, well, receivables, total receivables. For example, Ford Motor Company, you know them well. They have 42% of their total assets. assets. That's, you know, property, plan, equipment, cash, uh, inventory, all those assets that they have, 42% are just receivables. So there are two issues when we talk about accounts receivable, and that is recognizing accounts receivable and valuing. Recognizing accounts receivable for a service organization, which we did in the first three chapters, um, first four chapters, excuse me, we record receivable when it performs a service on account. So if you are, say, an attorney, you perform a service, you send a bill to your client, that's a receivable. They owe you that. A merchandiser, like at Walmart, they record accounts receivable at the point of sale. So when you sell the goods on account, that's when you record the accounts receivable. Assume that Jordish Company on July 1st, 2014 sells merchandise on account to Polo Company for $1,000, terms 210 and 30. You might remember from Chapter 5 that this means a 2% discount if paid in 10 days with the net balance being due in 30 days. The journal entry record this transaction. Again, we've seen this in Chapter 5. It's just accounts receivable and sales revenue. So at the time that they deliver the goods, we are going to record this, this uh, accounts receivable. And then on July 5th, they return merchandise worth $100. Again, we've seen this in Chapter 5, but just as a refresher, we have this account, sales returns and allowances, which reduces receivable with the amount the customers owe us. And then on July 11th, Jordash receives payment for the company for the balance due. Well, remember that the payment is going to be the $1,000, but don't forget that we took out $100 because they returned. So they only owed us $900, but we offered a 2% discount and they paid within the 10 days, so they got the discount. And so the balance is $900. Some retailers issue their own credit cards. Assume that you use your JCPenney company credit card to purchase clothing with the sales price of $300. Well, the journal entry 
is the same when you uh, record it. But assuming that you owe $300 at the end of the month and they charge 1.5% uh, per month on the balance due, then when you pay, you're going to also have the receivable of the 1.5% of the $300. Now, how do we value accounts receivable? First of all, accounts receivable almost always occur in asset. That is, when you sell on account, it's always due within a year. The valuation is at net realizable value, which means the amount that you expect to receive from the customer. Well, wouldn't that be the full amount? Well, not always if you expect them not to pay, for example. So we have something called uncollectible accounts receivable. Well, when you sell on account, you raise the possibility of the accounts not being collected. So the seller records losses that result from extending credit as bad debt expense. That is, that's the expected amount that the customers will not pay. We call it bad debts expense. Those are for the uncollectible accounts. And we have a couple of ways for dealing with those uncollectible accounts. One's called the allowance method. Here, the companies estimate uncollectible accounts receivable. And the journal entry is to debit bad debt expense, again, that's an expense account, and credit allowance for doubtful accounts, which is a contra asset. Contra just means it has the opposite balance of normal. Well, normal asset for a for an asset is a debit balance, so that means the contra is going to have a normal credit balance. It's not a normal debit balance like most assets do. Companies debit um, allowance for doubtful account and credit accounts receivable when you write off the account as uncollectible. And not, that just means that, okay, a customer doesn't pay. And when they don't pay, you have to write off the account, it just means take it off of your books and you make that entry. So assume that we have these balances. Remember that accounts receivable is an asset, so that's why we have a credit balance over here. And allowance for doubtful accounts is a contra asset, which means opposite, so it has a credit balance. So we record a sale on account in the journal entry up here, what does that, that going to do? That's going to increase our accounts receivable. And then assume we collected $333. We debit cash, credit accounts receivable. How does that affect our accounts? What's well, going to reduce our accounts receivable by the amount we collected? So it's just taking the amount and posting it. Well, what if we assume from those sales that we expect not to collect $15? That's when we're going to have this entry. That's for the estimated. That's not the actual. That's our estimated bad debts, expense, and allowance for doubtful accounts. So that is going to increase what they credit our allowance for doubtful accounts. And so now it goes up. And then if $10 are written off, which means we expect not to collect them, what's that going to do? It's going to reduce our allowance, right? And it's going to reduce our accounts receivable. So on the balance sheet, the accounts receivable is shown net, that is subtracting the allowance. So we're going to take the accounts receivable minus the allowance for doubtful accounts to get what they call the net balance. And that's how it's shown on the balance sheet. That's why they call that net realizable value is how much you expect to collect. We have another method for dealing with uncollectible accounts. It's called the direct write-off method. Now this method is, um, is another method, but if you, you'll talk about it in a second, it's not one that we typically use. So assume that we write off 
Emmy Duran's $200 balance as uncollectible. The entry is, well, <clears throat> now notice the difference. Instead of debiting the allowance account, we directly debit the bad debt expense. So we do not set up an estimated bad debt expense. We just wait till there's a write-off and then record it. It seems a lot simpler, but unfortunately it's not theoretically sound because what we don't do is match those expenses to the revenues they help to create. And the receivables not stated at, net, at realizable value, the amount you expect to collect, and therefore it's not acceptable. It's not GAAP. Some companies might use it because it's not materially different from the allowance method, but it's not GAAP. Let's go through another, another illustration of these uncollectibles. Hampson Furniture has credit sales of 1.2 million of which 200,000 remains uncollected at December 31st. The credit manager estimates that 12,000 of these sales will prove uncollectible. So therefore, we set up, now this is an estimated amount. Now notice this is an adjusting entry at year end to record those estimated uncollectibles. The vice president Hampson, uh, of Hampson Furniture on March 1st, we're going to the next year, authorizes a write-up of $500 balance owed by RA Ware. So this company owes us money, they don't pay, and so we write it off. We reduce the allowance. So the allowance is set up for the purpose of writing off any bad debts subsequent to the sale. Now, sometimes you write it off and then they surprise you and come back later and pay. So if that company comes back later and pays, then what we're going to have to do is reverse that entry that we just made. Notice that all we did in this entry is flip around the one we did in the previous slide. And then we record the cash collection as normal. So this is the normal uh, entry we make for collecting cash for on account. So the estimating the allowance is uh, this allowance method, which is the way we should be doing it. And we have something called the percentage of receivables basis, which is a, an alternative to the method we just saw before when we had some percentage of sales. This method is something that emphasizes the balance sheet relationships because it's, you see the relationship between your two balance sheet accounts, which is your accounts receivable and your allowance. What we have, uh, some companies will prepare what's called an aging schedule. An aging schedule, it just takes all of your customers, lists them out, and the total balance they owe. So the customer owe $39,600. But then what you do is you age them. Age them means how far past the sale date is the receivable. So if the terms were net 30, meaning they had to pay in 30 days, these ones that say not yet due means we haven't gone past the 30 day period yet. But then ones over here where it says number of days past due, this is how far past the 30 days they are. And there's no magic to these uh, cutoffs, but it's pretty typical. You kind of do one month, two months, three months, and then over three months. And now we're just listing the balance in the account. So this total balance comes over here. You got the 600 is $300. There are only one to 30 days past due, $200, 61 to 90 days past due, and $100 over 90 days past due. Now, what we're going to do is then add up each of those sections to come down here and get us a total per category, what they call per aging category. And then from that, we apply an estimated percentage uncollectible. So of those, of the balance, of the balance in the yellow circle there, 
of the balance, what percentage do you expect not to collect? And so you would expect that the farther past due they are, the more you're not going to collect, the more uncollectible they are. For example, if it's they're only one to 30 days past due, it's a relatively low amount. But if it's over 90 days past due, it's a pretty big up percentage. And so then you multiply through the amount due times the percentage to get the total uncollectible, total estimated uncollectible by category. And then add up all of these categories and you will get the total estimated uncollectible. So therefore you expect not to collect $2,228. Now remember that $2,228? So that is our estimated uncollectible. So here's an illustration. Assume the unadjusted trial balance shows allowance for doubtful accounts with a credit balance of 528. Now look down here in your T account. There's the right there is your uh, 528 credit balance. Prepare the adjusting entry. Assume $2,228. That's from the aging schedule in the previous slide is the estimate of uncollectible receivables from the aging schedule. That's what we came up with. But that's the balance. And so that comes down here into the balance. And what we need to do is prepare the journal entry based on the adjustment. So look down at your T account. You had a $528 balance. You want it to be, your desired balance is 2,228. So therefore you have an adjustment of 1,700. That's the number to get you to five, from 528 to 2,228. So therefore, your adjusting entry is the $1,700 here. The very common mistake to want to put the $2,228 as your adjustment, but using the percentage of receivables method and that aging method, that gives you the ending balance, not the adjustment. Okay, let's go to our second type of receivable, which is a note receivable. Companies may grant credit in exchange for a promissory note, which is a written promise to pay a specified amount of money on demand or at a de definite time. Promissory notes may be used when individual or companies lend money, for example, a bank, when an amount of transaction credit period exceed, exceed normal limits. So maybe you normally have a 30-day credit period and you're going to grant credit to someone for 90 days. Uh, then you go to a promissory note or if they're settling accounts receivable they can't pay their receivable so you settle it that is pay it off with a note receivable so a note receivable is just a little more formal than an accounts receivable and it tends to accrue interest so here's what a note looks like it has the amount up here in the upper left corner it also has the, um, the due date up here in the upper right corner when, not the due date, that's the date when you signed it. The due date is how far after, so two months after May 1st is when it's due. It has the payee, the payee is to whom you owe, or who, who yes, to whom you owe, and the amount, which is $1,000 again, just kind of in two spots there, and then the interest rate. And finally, the maker of the note. The maturity date can be expressed in either months or days. To compute the interest amount, the interest amount is equal to the face value times the interest rate times the time in terms of one year. So the interest rates are always expressed in annual terms. So you always have to adjust it to an annual basis. And when counting days, if you're doing a daily, you omit the date the note is issued, but include the due date. 
So here's some examples. If you were had a $730 note, which is the face value, at 12% rate for 120 days, we take the face value, 730, times 12%, times the time, which is 120. It's kind of weird in accounting for some reason we don't use 365 in the denominator for counting days. We use 360. So it's something that's been around for a long, long time. So let's uh, look at an example. Brent Company wrote a $1,000 two-month 8% promissory note dated May 1st to settle an open account. Prepare the entry Wilma would make for the receipt of the note. Okay, so we debit notes receivable and credit accounts receivable. When they when you see this uh, language to settle an open account, that means an accounts receivable. So we're swapping a notes receivable for accounts receivable. Why do they do that? Companies having trouble making payment, so we ex kind of extend the terms but start charging interest. How do you dispose or get rid of a note? How do you terminate a note? Well, one way to do it is just wait till the maturity date. When is the note is due? If it's due in two months, wait till then, then pay it off. Or the maker may default on the note and the payee must make an adjustment to the account. You default means you don't pay. Or the holder, that is the payee, speeds up conversion by selling the note. So if you honor the note, it just means you pay it in full at its due date. Dishonor the note means you don't pay it in full. That means you owe it and um, you know one way or another the company's going to try to collect from you. So if you honor the note, let's say it's a $10,000 note, June 1st accepting five month 9% interest note. They present the note to Higley on November 1st, maturity date. The entry to record the collection is. So this is the collection of the note. We're going to get cash and interest. Get rid of the note and record interest revenue. Now remember how we record interest. We take the face value times the interest rate times time. Now how do we get this? Well remember the 9% is in annual terms. So divide by 12 to get it in monthly terms and then multiply by the number of months. Now where do we get 5? Well, it's on June 1st, so we start counting June. June 1, July 2, August 3, September 4, October 5. Not November because it's November 1st, so 5 months. Well, suppose instead that they prepare their financial statements as of September 30. Remember what you do at the end of every at the end of every counting period when you make your uh, financial statements, you have to do adjusting entries. So if it if it year ends on September 30th, then from June 1st to September 30th is four months, and then September 30th until you pay it off is one month. So we need to, therefore, on September 1st, uh, this is actually, this should be September 30th. Sorry, let's correct that. September 30th, when you're accruing, you're going to accrue for the four months of interest. And you, and, and you still credit interest revenue, but notice the debit now is the interest receivable because you didn't get the cash, but they owe you the cash, so you're going to receive it in the future. And then on November 1st, when they pay off the note, you're going to get your cash. So it's still the 10375 which is five months worth of interest plus the original face value. But now the note's receivable. It's still at 10000 but the interest receivable, which you accrued for last month, now you're receiving and then the interest revenue is for the one month of November. And just just as an example of how you might see the receivables on an actual financial statements, 
this is Deere, Deere and Company, you know, like John Deere. And notice the different receivables accounts. You have all these different receivables here. And then we subtract out the allowance separately. Well, how do we evaluate receivables? Remember we talked about before about liquidity, which means how close your assets are to cash or how quickly they can be uh, converted to cash. Now this is data from Nike and we have the sales data and we have the accounts receivable data. We have two different ratios we can compute. One's called the accounts receivable turnover ratio, which is net credit sales divided by average net accounts receivable. And then we take that receivable and it goes, see this receivable then, I mean the uh, turnover, goes into the denominator of the second one, which is the average collection period. We just take 365 and divide it by that turnover we just computed. So using the Nike data, we take sales down here, which is from up top here, divided by average accounts receivable. So average, we're gonna take the two receivables and add it together down here and divide by two to get average. And then that number, the 7.2, is the denominator for the average collection period, 365. So what does this tell you? We, on average, we sell and then collect all receivables 7.2 times or once every 50 days we collect our receivables. We sell on account and then 50 days it takes us to collect on account. And you'll notice over time, see we want this number, the average collection period to be low. So you can see that over time that uh, 2010 versus 2000 and um, sorry, um, 2010 versus Skechers, they're about the same. And the industry average though is 30 days, just at 30 days. So both Nike and uh, Skechers are kind of behind when it comes to the to that statistic. The final way to dispose of your receivable is to sell them. So what happens is you have a receivable and maybe it takes too long to collect it and you need your money now. So you can sell it. And you normally sell it to what's called a factor. A factor is a finance company like a, a bank or some other financial institution that buys receivable from the business for a fee and then they collect directly from the customer. So you're just, it's an asset and you're selling it like any other asset. Here's an illustration, assume that Hendrickson Furniture factor 600,000 of receivables to Federal Factors Inc. Federal Factors assesses service charge of 2% and the amount of receivables sold. So what they're gonna do is they're going to um, remove the receivable, right? So the receivable is $600,000, we're gonna remove that, but we're gonna take a 2% charge, a so 2% of 600,000, and then the difference between the two is how much cash you get. So the 2% just represents a service charge. Well, sometimes companies will have a uh, credit card, not their own credit card, but a national credit card like Visa, MasterCard, American Express. In this case now we have three parties because we have the credit card issuer, say Visa, the retailer where you're buying the item, and then the customer. The retailer pays the credit card issuer a fee of two to 4% of the invoice price for his services, sometimes even a little more. So it costs, it's pretty expensive for a retailer to use credit cards, but they do it for convenience, obviously, of the customer. So Morgan Marie purchases 1,000 compact discs for her restaurant from Sangarath, music company and she charges this amount on her Visa First Bank card. The service fee that First Bank charges is 3%. So they're going to have to pay 3% of a thousand or $30. They're still going to have their 
um, they're still going to have their thousand dollar service revenue thousand dollars but the three percent is a service charge three percent of a thousand so that they don't get the full amount and FASB uh, in terms of the FASB and the International County Standards Board looking at IFERS they they are fairly similar when it comes to receivables they're both are trying to work towards what's called a fair, fair value measurement which means how much you can currently sell the receivables what's the value of the receivables and they both want to do that but they're getting a lot of pushback from the users so what they've done is a two-step approach and the first step they said you just have to disclose the fair value no don't adjust them on your books on your financial statements but in the notes to the statements you disclose them the second step is they've allowed an option so companies can choose if they want to to value at fair value well that wraps up our accounting for receivables i'll talk to you soon